They say to keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Today, we delve into a case where naive trust, which was once the cornerstone of loyal partnerships, begins to crumble, where love becomes a mere bargaining chip, and when the cost is too high, those indebted begin to reveal a web of deceit. The facade of the perfect life falls away, exposing the tangled mess of lies and secret affairs that threaten to consume everyone involved, and it ends up costing one of them their life. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 13 of the Dark Levity Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberlea, and I'm here with my co-host, my boyfriend, my best friend, my partner in crime, and my future baby daddy, <laughs> Jonathan. Hi. I added that last part in for one of our viewers who commented last week that they expected to hear me add that to the list. <laughs> so there you go. Dumble s'mores. Is that how we say that? Dumble s'mores. Dumble s'mores. <laughs> I hope I'm saying it right because we were definitely debating on the name. But you said it was like... It's like Dumbledore, right? Dumbledore. Dumble s'mores. Yeah. Okay. I'm hungry now. Once again, we're so glad you're here. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next episode. They should be out every week now on Monday. That's if we are on time. And we're going to try our best. And today's a special day. It we is. We have... Our very first sponsor supporting today's episode, and it's a fun one. I've showcased this one before on my main channel, and it's lots of slots. It's a free-to-play mobile slots game, and you can play it anytime, anywhere. And all the excitement and the sounds and the music, it really just changes my mood instantly, which I need right now, you know, <laughs> considering. And I really love my favorite game, the piggy game. It's so easy to get started. Just click the link below in the description box or scan the QR code up on the screen to download lots of slots. And you can get 20 million free coins as a new player, but also $9 worth of coins as one of our subscribers. Right. And you can discover an endless array of thrilling slots that keep you entertained for hours. With new slots being released every week, you'll never run out of exciting options to choose from. Sometimes we just need to take our mind off of whatever's going on. And I like to play lots of slots when I'm rendering these videos. Oh yes, it because makes the time go by very fast. It really does. And like I said, my favorite game is the Bing Oink. It features a really cute little piggy and doggy. And I still have all my really cool stickers yeah, from do. the last time. And I always like to win big when I play it. My favorite thing to do is the auto spin and I raise my bet high enough to win and I'm gonna show you how much fun this is. You see, I like the more classic Vegas style slots like Lava Loot. I have a sticker that says that. <laughs> and I know that's the one with the princess or the queen yeah. and the fireballs. Mm -hmm. But lots of slots goes way beyond the average slots game. It has plenty of opportunities to play games so you can always have enough coins to keep spinning. For example, I like to play the mini games for coins that you can play with the slots, like the space battle game, or you can spin the golden wheel. I personally like to play the space battle when I get the extra coins because it's fun. It reminds me of a pinball machine. Look at this little spaceship just earning me a bunch of coins. Or the wild cash mini game. That's easy for new players where you just basically pick a treasure chest to reveal what's inside. I like that one because it's really easy to get a bunch of coins. Yeah, that one is really good. And right now, Lots of Slots is celebrating St. Patrick's Day. And you're invited to the carnival where you have a chance to win big. And I'm talking $1,200 worth of lots of cash for epic spins and another $1,200 worth of free coins to keep those jackpots rolling in. And for all you collectors out there, you can get those super rare in-game and props during the carnival. Come join right now and see all the holiday related events. So click the link below or scan the QR code to get 20 million coins for new players and exclusive gift coins, which are an extra $9 worth of coins. And thank you so very much to Lots of Slots for sponsoring today's video. Now, let's get into the case. Today, we're introducing you to two married couples who became a very close friends. Bonnie and Jeffrey Zach, and Edward and Cynthia George, who are all living in the Midwest town of Akron, Ohio. And yes, both of these men have double names, a first and a last name that could be a first name, and it has been driving me crazy. I don't want any of you to get confused, and since there are a few people to keep track of, we're going to start with one couple and then go to the next. So let's begin with Edward and Cynthia George. 
Edward Joseph George was very well known throughout Ohio and was considered one of the wealthiest men in Akron. He's a local restaurateur who owned the Tangier. It's a bistro club and banquet facility known for their authentic Mediterranean cuisine. The restaurant had an attached nightclub and a cabaret that could be rented out for special events and concerts. Ed had made millions of dollars over the years and was known as a wealthy Lebanese businessman to those in the area. His establishment was frequented by the most successful and rich residents locally. It's also a very popular spot for weddings. Ed was one of the eight children born into a close and successful Lebanese Catholic family. He graduated from Michigan State before entering the family business. Ed's father, Ed Sr., opened and operated the original Tangier establishment in 1948. After a fire, Ed Sr. rebuilt it, expanding it into an adjacent property and adding on the entertainment and event center. In its heyday, it featured the musical talents of the Beach Boys, Tina Turner, Ray Charles, The Temptations, and even James Brown, just to name a few. It had 11 banquet rooms, and it felt like you were in the Atlantic City Hotel and Casino. Many of the rooms were themed and had over-the-top opulent decor. Ed had seven children with his stunning socialite wife, Cynthia Rohr George. She was a petite and striking blonde with piercing blue eyes. She turned heads everywhere she went. She was described as a bombshell who exuded sex appeal and attracted men from all walks of life. But long before meeting Edward, Cynthia Rohr was born into generational poverty in a factory town in North Canton, Ohio. Her father, a dedicated coal miner, worked tirelessly to provide for the family, and her mother stayed home and took care of the household. But despite her father's best efforts, they lived a modest and humble life. Little Cynthia did not have all the luxuries and material possessions that the other girls her age did. However, her upbringing instilled in her determination to seek a better life. She promised herself that she would find wealth and success. She was driven by her desire to rise above her circumstances and create a brighter future. She was raised a strict Catholic and was unable to afford her dream of attending art school. So she worked various jobs like a flight attendant, hoping to move forward in life. But over time, the high school cheerleader believed her only path in life to the wealth that she longed for would be to capitalize on her beauty, which everyone around her couldn't help but notice. Because of how she grew up, she had a deep fear of ending up without the means to support herself. So she knew that she had to capitalize on her looks before her beauty faded away. She aspired to be wealthy no matter what and used her beauty in that pursuit. And that is exactly how she met her husband, Ed. In 1978, when Cynthia was 24 years old, she auditioned to be a dancer at the Tangier nightclub. Despite not being selected for the job, she successfully accomplished one thing. She captivated the attention of the club's owner, Ed George, who was 40 years old at that time, 16 years her senior. Ed never had time for relationships or marriage, but all that changed when he met the stunning Cynthia Rohr. The physical attraction seemed to only go in one direction, from Ed to Cynthia. Ed wasn't classically attractive, but as far as Cynthia was concerned, he more than made up for what he lacked in looks with his wallet. And you know, that's what she intended to do, use her looks to become wealthy. So this worked for her. Actually, Ed's wealth was Cynthia's favorite part of her soon-to-be boyfriend. Ed was smitten and determined to make her his bride, but they didn't rush into it. After all, Ed was a traditional devout Catholic man. After six years of dating, Ed and Cynthia were finally married in 1984. Cynthia accomplished her dream. The couple exchanged their vows in front of 500 guests and a 60-piece orchestra as their proud mother sang two solos during the ceremony. They came out in a horse-drawn carriage, and this was celebrated in Akron like the royal wedding would be celebrated. Ed and Cynthia, who eventually went by Cindy, seemed to have the perfect life. They resided in a magnificent 8,500-square-foot, five-bedroom, and five-and-a-half-bath mansion nestled on a vast 18-acre property that Ed already owned. The garage alone was bigger than the house Cindy had grown up in. The couple knew they wanted children right away, and over the next few years, Cindy gave birth to four children, all girls. However, she was very tiny and frail, and each one of her pregnancies had its own issues. She was usually bedridden, but the Georges knew they wanted a more prominent family and had the means to provide for more children. So they adopted two more, another girl, and finally, a little boy. Their family was complete, or so they thought. A few years later, in 1994, at the age of 40, Cindy got pregnant again. Unexpectedly, but of course being of Catholic faith, the Georges believed every child was a gift from God and were excited about their final new arrival with another little girl. Now this truly completed their family. 
The Georges had it all from the very beginning. Housekeepers, groundskeepers, assistants, a nanny, you name it. And they needed help. Ed was always at the restaurant, but despite his long hours of work, he was extremely hands-on as a father. Each morning, he would get up with the children. He would get them ready, brush their hair, take them to school. And in the evenings after work, he would help them with their homework. He never missed any of their school or sporting events, despite being a self-described workaholic. But Cindy, on the other hand, she relied heavily on their nanny, Marianne Brewer, to help her raise her children. Marianne's help enabled Cindy to not only have this big family that she always dreamed of, but the freedom to be independent, which meant Cindy could spend time shopping with her friends, hanging out at the Tangier nightclub, drinking and rubbing elbows with the town's elite, and even entering beauty pageants. Sometimes the employees of the Tangier were watching the George children while Ed was working, and they never knew why Cindy wasn't with her kids. But many times, she would only come home long enough to shower and change before heading back out again. She was a very social person. And Cindy had always seen her husband as more of a father figure. He was always busy with work. Cindy needed to fill her time with a lot of activities so she wouldn't get bored. Still, even with a calendar full of events, Cindy desired attention, especially from the opposite sex. Not too long after they were married, Cindy had already started flirting with many of the men who frequented the Tangier, and over time she was able to compartmentalize her feelings for her husband and engage in very many extramarital affairs, none of which Ed was aware of. Despite Ed's great wealth, Cindy often complained that he didn't give her enough money to do the things she wanted. While Ed couldn't control her affairs, he could control her with money to a certain degree. When Cindy accompanied Ed to work, she would use it as an excuse to flirt and dance with the best looking men all right in front of her husband's face. Still, Ed didn't seem to care. And he wasn't jealous. It was probably because he thought Cindy couldn't manage on her own. Now, among the George's large circle of acquaintances and friends was another couple we mentioned in the beginning of the video, Jeffrey and Bonnie Zack. Let's start by introducing you to Jeffrey. He was born to his mother Elaine and father David Zack on January 20th, 1957, and is of Israeli descent. By 1976, Jeff had dropped out of high school and decided to move to Israel to explore his Jewish roots. He ended up becoming an Israeli citizen and eventually joined the army as a paratrooper. He was trained to navigate minefields and had experience handling explosives. According to Jeff, he had fought behind enemy lines after jumping from attack helicopters. Jeff spoke several languages, including Arabic, and he spoke Hebrew fluently. He would often confidently tell people that he had been a Mossad agent. The Mossad is an Israeli national intelligence agency. They are responsible for intelligence gathering, covert operations, and counterterrorism outside of Israel. They are Israel's version of the CIA. Due to the nature of their work, the Mossad had gained the reputation for being one of the most influential and proficient intelligence agencies globally. Due to the high sensitivity of the work, those who have worked for Mossad would likely keep that information private. Jeff returned to the U.S. three years after his exciting mission to Israel. In 1986, when he was 29 years old, he was at a restaurant in Arizona when he met a strikingly beautiful brunette with big blue eyes and a bright smile named Bonnie Buchar. They hit it off immediately. At this point in life, Jeff wanted to settle down, get married, and have kids. And Bonnie wanted the same thing. She thought they were meant to be. They made a gorgeous couple. Jeff was tall, athletic, and quite the ladies' man. The couple had a whirlwind romance and married in only three months. Unfortunately, that is when Bonnie saw another side of Jeff. She realized he had quite the temper. Actually, it was like he had two different sides. It was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Bonnie never knew which personality she was going to get, so she said she had to brace herself every day. And why is it that I hear that all the time? It's like once someone gets married, things change. No wonder why some people shy away from it. But I really don't think anyone can hide behind their facade for long. Yeah, everyone always puts their best foot forward. That's true. Or their best face forward. Mm -hmm. And then the mask gets lifted off. Jeff was full of himself. Arrogant, overbearing, and argumentative. But Bonnie also saw the good in him. He was intelligent, charismatic, and of course, she thought he was very good looking. They may have had their ups and downs, but they made it work. And after two years of getting married, they had their son, Brian, in 1988. Jeff always seemed to be into something, trying to make ends meet with his next brilliant business idea. He frequently changed jobs. He'd been a stockbroker, a headhunter, a construction worker, a brick mason. He had a scrap metal business. 
and even helped obtain visas for immigrants, but nothing ever lasted. The family also moved around a lot and finally found themselves settled down in a nice four-bedroom, three-bath, two-story home on Temple Trail in Stowe, Ohio, where Jeff got into the vending machine business. Even though Jeff's jobs may have changed over the years, one thing stayed the same. He was still belligerent and impulsive. He even had several run-ins with the law and was not someone who was easy to get along with. And even though you might think, why doesn't Bonnie just leave Jeff if he treated her so badly? Well, it's not as though there hadn't been times when she thought about it. But Jeff would let her know in no uncertain terms that if she ever tried to leave or divorce him, he would take their son away to Israel and she would never see him again. So soon after moving to Ohio, the Zacks met the Georges when Bonnie and Jeff were having dinner one night at the Tangier. It wasn't exactly the best first impression for any of them. Actually, Bonnie and Jeff were enjoying their dinner when Bonnie noticed that her husband's gaze was fixed on a stunning woman with an hourglass figure and long blonde hair that was seated at the bar, fully engrossed in conversation with a group of customers. Bonnie could not help but feel a pang of jealousy as she sat there watching her husband and his obvious attention toward this other woman. It was overt. He wasn't hiding it at all. And finally, Jeff just couldn't resist commenting on her attractive appearance. Him and his wife were continuing their meal and Jeff just said out loud to Bonnie, boy, she looks good. (laughs) And then she killed him and that's the end of the story. (laughs) I'm kidding, but wow. The audacity of this man, and this is just the beginning. Bonnie, of course, felt frustrated and insecure as her husband's words burned in her ears. She believed this woman's presence affected Jeff so much he could barely focus on his meal or for her for that matter. So in an attempt to pull his attention away in a very playful and teasing manner, Bonnie jokingly remarked to her husband that that gorgeous woman at the bar would never be interested in him. She was totally out of his league. Bonnie made this lighthearted comment, not intending to challenge her husband, but just break him away from his rude behavior. However, Jeff took her word seriously, as though she had dared him to pursue this woman. It was a harmless joke, but Jeff's reaction suggested he thought otherwise. He got up from the table, he walked right over to the strikingly beautiful blonde woman, and he introduced himself. This woman was Cindy George. And from that moment on, Bonnie felt insignificant in Jeff's eyes, and this wouldn't be the last time her husband gave another woman his attention. Like Cindy, Jeff knew that the ladies thought he was handsome. He often exploited his good looks to get what he wanted. He was a handsome man, six foot four, and years earlier, he had gone prematurely gray. His hair was almost entirely white, which made him stand out in a good way. Well, after the brief introduction, Ed George made his way over to the bar. He was used to other men flirting with his wife, and Ed introduced himself to Jeff, and Jeff complimented Ed on how beautiful his wife is. Ed, who had probably made the same joke hundreds of times, replied by saying, if you can afford her, you can have her, before walking away and returning to his business. Well, Jeff leaned over and whispered into Cindy's ear. He told her she deserved better than a man like that, not knowing precisely who Ed George was. Jeff didn't leave Cindy's side for the rest of the night. Instead, he invited her over to meet Bonnie. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. Then they spent the rest of the night dancing, talking, hanging out together, even though Bonnie was uncomfortable just sitting at the table alone. But that night, Jeff also got to talk to Ed. And of course, once Jeff realized Ed was the owner of the Tangier, he quickly put on his charm, knowing he could be friends with the wealthiest man in town. Jeff was always looking for the next business venture, and soon the two men were talking and getting together on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, even though their first impression wasn't great, Cindy and Bonnie became close friends. Cindy would come over to Jeff and Bonnie's with her kids, and they would play with Brian, and then Cindy and Ed would invite Bonnie and Jeff over to their place for dinner. They spent holidays like Thanksgiving and Christmas together, and eventually... Ed invested in Jeff's vending machine business, giving him enough money to buy 100 vending machines that he could place all over town. Because of their partnership, Jeff would frequently be over Ed's house, and the two couples got together and got closer and closer over the years. Even Jeff's mother, Elaine, who he had a very strong bond with, would go to the Tangier to be introduced to the Georges, and she would see them or at least see Cindy and Bonnie every time she would come visit. It was like they were all inseparable. Elaine would even come over to her son's place to cook dinner for the two families. And now if you're wondering whether Bonnie ever questioned Jeff about 
If there anything more was happening between him and Cindy, she had. But when she did, he would become angry and he would call her bitter and jealous. He told Bonnie that he and Cindy were just friends and she would never come between their relationship. He told Bonnie that Cindy was his business partner and she would need to learn to get past her insecurities. But to be fair, he was the one who made her feel insecure to begin with. And I commend her for actually being strong enough to to be in the situation despite her feelings. As, as far as I know, I'm pretty sure anyone that comes up with a defensive tactic is probably doing something wrong instead of yes. having just a normal conversation. They're business partners. Jeff was also being paid to come over and fix things on the George's property. He was somewhat of a handyman, so he would do odd jobs at their house and business. Despite Jeff's initial strong attraction to Cindy, Bonnie let it go, and she didn't really see anything she thought was inappropriate happening between them. Besides, the Georges became the Zach's primary source of income, and Bonnie didn't want to get in the middle of that, and life went on for both of the couples. Though over time, as their kids got older, they didn't have as many playdates and hangouts as they did in the beginning. As the years went on, Jeff and Bonnie were busy raising their son Brian. Jeff was still managing all of his vending machines, making sure they were fully stocked, and things had shifted a bit career-wise. Bonnie had become a successful real estate agent and soon became the family's main provider. Jeff, though known to be abrasive and not the best husband, did spend a lot of time with his son. They were close, even though Brian didn't like the way his father treated his mother. Brian would help his father stock the vending machines on Saturdays, and they would go to wholesale stores to buy candy and snacks, then distribute them to Jeff's vending machines all over town. When Jeff wasn't working, he watched Brian play football at school. It was a pretty ordinary life, and as far as Jeff's and Bonnie's marriage was concerned, it had its ups and downs, good and bad. It had been rocky here and there, but over a decade later, they were together working it out. Now what about Ed and Cindy? Well, from the outside, they seem to have a the perfect life. But even with all the money that you could want, excellent private education for all their children, all the independence that Cindy could ever ask for, she was increasingly depressed and withdrawn. Her friends thought she needed some excitement in her life, if they only knew. So in the year 2000, they encouraged her to enter the local Mrs. Ohio pageant. Now, this pageant is a little bit different. It's not the Miss Ohio's pageant. It's the Mrs. Ohio pageant. And one of the requirements is that you are married. Among other things, like no prior nude publications, you have to be a resident of the state of Ohio and at least 21 years of age. And that was one of the challenges Cindy knew she would be facing, competing against women in their 20s while she was in her 40s. But that didn't seem to faze her. She enjoyed a challenge. She was always someone who took care of herself. She had a personal trainer that she saw a few times a week, and she had always been slender and in great shape. And she still looked fabulous. And I just want to say that I saw a post, and I shared it on Instagram the other day, and I'll put it up on the screen, but it's about women in their 40s. I'm one of them. And it says, she looks amazing, and she's over 40. What's her secret? And that's when it says her secret is that 40 is young and you're being brainwashed by the media to think that you're constantly rotting and deteriorating every second. So you'll buy crap and never gain awakening to that. And I have to agree. I'm, I think 40 is young. I'm 41. I'm going to be 42. Yeah. And you're going to be 38. I don't think we're old. No, I don't feel old. But I guess it is also how someone takes care of themselves. And Cindy did take care of herself. And she was excited about this pageant. The winner would go on to compete in their international pageant against all the other women from the States who won first place. And if you win internationally, you get a ton of prizes, none of which Cindy really needed. Things like free gold jewelry, gift certificates, photo shoots, things like that. But the real prize is clout. And of course, the crown and the title. And that is what Cindy was after. That would boost her self-esteem if it even needed boosting. So Cindy started working out even more, dieting and getting ready. The categories were fitness, bikini, evening gown, as well as an interview component with the intention of promoting successful married life and the importance of family values throughout the state. Cindy couldn't wait. 
She wanted to be crowned the most beautiful wife and mother in the state of Ohio. After months of preparation, the day had finally come. Cindy took the stage in front of her family and friends, and she walked the runway in her gorgeous evening gown and didn't even show a little bit of self-doubt donning a bathing suit in front of hundreds of people. Finally, they announced the top five contestants, and Cindy was one of them. Everyone thought she was going to win. I mean, she's a mother of seven, gorgeous, well-spoken, and had always been a fixture in her community. Well, as they announced the winners, they went from runners-up to first place. And Cindy was third runner-up. She didn't win the crown, though she smiled as the winner was crowned and congratulated all the other ladies who placed. Deep down, Cindy was disappointed, but her appearance at the big event made her even more of a local celebrity. She became even more popular at the Tangier nightclub. Still, while reveling in her new celebrity status, she and Ed were about to hear some devastating news. Just after noon on Father's Day, Saturday, June 16th, 2001, several 911 calls came into the Akron Police Department. A man had been shot at Point Blake Range while sitting in his Ford Explorer at a gas pump located at a BJ Wholesale Club. He was still alive, but barely breathing. A doctor and nurse were in the area and both pulled the man out of the vehicle and to the ground and began administering CPR until the emergency personnel arrived on scene. When first responders got there, they found the victim with a star-shaped hole on the side of his cheek where the bullet had penetrated his head. He was rushed to the Akron City Hospital in critical condition. When officers began examining the vehicle, they saw a wallet inside. They opened it and found the ID of 44-year-old Jeffrey Zack. Unfortunately, back at the hospital, he was pronounced dead on arrival. Jeff didn't die immediately. He suffered. He choked on his blood for the last few minutes of his life. Sadly, he died a horrific and painful death. That's really sad and really terrifying. And this was now a murder investigation. And the lead detective assigned to the case was Sergeant Ed Moriarty. And from the moment he arrived at the murder scene, he began hearing some pretty horrible things about their victim. But before we get into that, we want to tell you what was found when he arrived. Jeff's dark blue SUV with its tan interior was still sitting at the gas pump. There was yellow crime scene tape up all around the perimeter. The glass in the driver's side window was shattered, leaving only a few fragments behind in the window frame. The passenger side door was open, presumably from when Jeff was removed from the vehicle. The bullet had gone through Jeff's head and out the other side, shattering the passenger side window as well, leaving a gaping hole between the glass that was still left in place. Pieces of glass and a big pool of blood was found on the driver's seat. It was still wet. A mushroomed bullet was located outside on the street between the gas pump and the BJ's parking lot, and a shell casing was found about 100 yards away. Sergeant Moriarty's first task was to talk to all the witnesses who had been in that area to find out what they saw that afternoon. One of those witnesses was a gas pump attendant named Carolyn Ann Heisen. And from what was gathered in her interview, Jeff pulled his Ford Explorer up to the gas pump and someone pulled up behind him on a motorcycle. The motorcycle rider was dressed head to toe in black clothing, wearing a black helmet. And the helmet had a dark full face shield on it, which completely obscured his face. The motorcycle rider got off of his bike, calmly approached Jeff at the driver's side window, lifted his gun, and fired a single shot through the glass, then proceeded to get back on his motorcycle and take off. The copper-jacketed hollow-point bullet caused Jeff to immediately slump over his steering wheel. The damage from the single shot sprayed blood all over the inside of the driver's window and windshield. As the shooter walked away, he appeared to be looking straight at the pump attendant, Carolyn Heisen. She described the motorcycle as a ninja-style bike that was black and gray with neon lime green accent colors. The motorcycle had captured her attention because it was making really loud noises and revving its engine. Carolyn had grown up around guns, and she knew immediately that she had just heard gunfire. But she said other people were just oblivious, and they went about their day just pumping their gas and cleaning their windshields. Another witness had also seen that motorcycle. He noticed it riding back and forth up and down the street before the shooting, almost as if waiting for someone. 
Carolyn and the two managers went running over to Jeff's car. They looked inside the car and saw a white man with gray hair covered in blood. Carolyn immediately ran inside to call 911. Though witnesses had seen the motorcycle, no one saw the direction in which the shooter fled. They got the CCTV footage from the pump, but it was too grainy. And though you could see someone at the pump and maybe the killer coming up, it was way too hard to make out any of the details. Detectives were faced with a perplexing task as they tried to unravel the nature of the crime, mainly wondering whether Jeff Zack's shooting was a random act of violence, possibly a road rage incident. They imagined that Jeff may have cut someone off and that they caught up to him and shot him in anger. But remember we told you that as soon as Sergeant Morority began talking to the people at BJ's, he was already hearing really negative things about Jeff. That's not usual. Like This is the first time I think I've heard that a victim was being talked about negatively. We mentioned earlier that Jeff would frequently stock up on candy and snacks at wholesale stores like BJ's Warehouse and Wholesale Club. Jeff was well known at the specific BJ's wholesale location, not because he was always there buying inventory, but because he had a notorious reputation for flirting with female clerks. Recently, he pressured a 17-year-old employee to give him her phone number and then began harassing her with phone calls and offered to pay her for sex. Yeah. And this reminds me of those memes that say, when I die, don't lie and tell people that I lit up the room. <laughs> you know that? I'm not trying to be funny. I know that nobody's perfect, but it seemed as though in this case, Jeff was truly out of line. And eventually the girl's father got involved and threatened Jeff to stay away from his daughter. It was odd that Jeff was at this BJ's that day because one month earlier, he had been banned by management for his harassment of their female employees. This was not the first time he had done this. From the beginning of the investigation, the police already had a long list of suspects from spies to unhappy fathers of young girls who Jeff had harassed. He was not a likable guy, plain and simple. Everybody that knew him said it, but you already knew that. And some people described him as having a volatile personality. One minute he was kind and happy, and the next he was exploding in anger, just like Bonnie had said from the beginning, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And speaking of Bonnie, officers were on their way over to her home to deliver the devastating news, but also to interview her and find out more information about her husband. When the knock came on the door to inform Bonnie of her husband's death, she broke down and she needed to be escorted back inside her home. She remembers how they told her. They said, your husband's been shot and he's dead. Just like that. And she went into denial at that point. She was like, no, he cannot be dead. She told the detective they'd been married for 15 years and they had a 13-year-old son. She sat at the dining room table, just shaking and sobbing. She was distraught. But as much as this was a heartbreaking moment, or so it seemed to be for Jeff's long-suffering wife, she was their main suspect especially after hearing about how Jeff blatantly flirted and tried to pay for sex outside their marriage. Even though Bonnie was putting on the waterworks, she wouldn't be the first nor the last murder suspect to cry to investigators during a murder investigation. So it didn't mean much to them. But after she was able to calm down, they told her they needed to get as much information from her as they could starting with what happened that day before Jeff left the house. Bonnie explained that Jeff Zack sat at his computer upstairs on the morning of June 16th. Jeff, Brian, and Bonnie were all at home. His regular custom and practice was to resupply the machines and collect the money from the week on Saturday mornings. He would often take his son Brian with him. That morning, Jeff asked 13-year-old Brian to help him move a piece of furniture so he could repair a light fixture. Remember, Brian wasn't a fan of how Jeff treated his mother, especially on that day, so he decided to react in a way that would upset his father. When Brian refused to help, Jeff began yelling at his son. Feeling defiant, Brian ignored his father and went upstairs to his room. At this point, Jeff was feeling angry, so he screamed at his wife saying that he wanted a divorce and was never coming back. While those hurtful words were an empty threat, said with regularity, this day it would turn out to be true. Brian would look back upon this last encounter with his dad and feel tremendous guilt. His last interaction was an argument, but others might look at this as a blessing. By angering his father that morning, Brian was spared to have watched his father die, or worse, become collateral damage to an assassin. According to Bonnie, after Jeff stopped yelling at Brian, he came downstairs stomping around and looking for a fight. Jeff hadn't been home for a few days that week and came back in a terrible mood. This was a regular occurrence in the Zack household. 
Jeff usually tried to bait Bonnie into an argument and would tell her shocking and cruel things. This was the last morning of Jeff's life and it would be no different than any other Saturday morning. In one last attempt to get Bonnie to fight with him, he told her he had found someone new. He told her this person was better than her and he couldn't wait to leave. Jeff would often say this to his wife to upset her and even leave so he can go out and cheat. It wasn't anything she hadn't heard before. Jeff stormed out of the house alone and headed to BJ's Wholesale Club. BJ's is a wholesale warehouse club similar to Costco or Sam's Club. Like both those establishments, some of them have attached gas stations. And this was his routine. Jeff would go to BJ's each Saturday morning to buy supplies to restock his vending machines. But this time, it seemed like unbeknownst to Jeff, someone else knew his routine. That person had been watching and waiting for Jeff. At least, this is what it appeared to look like. It looked like it was a targeted hit. Yeah. And over the next few hours, detectives were told everything you already know about Jeff, including the part about him having worked for the Mossad. But they were unable to obtain any concrete proof or confirmation that that was true. In fact, when interviewing Jeff's rabbi, he said it best when he said that, quote, those who work for the Mossad would never tell you that they work for the Mossad, end quote. So investigators inferred that this was Jeff's way of embellishing his past life to sound much more exciting than the guy who ran a vending machine business. While one officer was questioning Bonnie, another was questioning their son, Brian. Brian confessed to arguing with his dad that day and relayed the hurtful threats that Jeff had made to his mother. As Brian talked to the investigators, it was clear that he had conflicted feelings about his father. He was sad that his father was gone. He loved him very much, but he hated the way his father treated his mother. Brian told the investigators that his dad supported his sports events, attended all of his games and practices, and Jeff had told Brian to always be the best at anything worth doing. And this must have resonated so much with him because he shared it with the investigators. Brian was very mature for his age. He wanted to help investigators find his father's killer. Brian told investigators that he knew that his dad cheated on his mother, and that implied that one of these women who he's cheating with, well, their husband may have wanted Jeff to be taken care of. But Brian also let them know that two of his football coaches had done a construction siding job for Jeff, and that siding job was never completed because Jeff refused to pay them, and they accused him of cheating them out of $7,000. Allegedly, there were threats of harm between these two men and Jeff. And Brian confirmed there were also threats of harm from the fathers of some of those girls he harassed at BJ's. When Bonnie was asked if she knew anyone who might want to hurt her husband, she said that Jeff had a temper and he could be loud, aggressive, and very opinionated. She also explained that Jeff refused to pay some of those contractors for doing the work on their home. And they had threatened him. She said Jeff had been receiving threatening calls and messages and that she'd saved one of them on the answering machine. She played that message for the detectives and we have it, so we're gonna play it for you as well. That message was from only a few days before Jeff was gunned down. It came in on Wednesday, June 13th at 2.55 p.m. It was a man's voice, and if you couldn't make out what he was saying or you're only listening and you didn't read the captions on the screen, he said, quote, All right, buddy, you've got one more out. You need to start answering your telephone, okay? I'll be talking to you, end quote. Bonnie said, When Jeff heard this message, he got all upset. He started pacing around, and she thought that he knew who it was, even though she didn't. In the days following this call, Jeff was unusually jumpy and nervous. He was in a terrible mood. And remember, he had been gone for a few days before this. So could that be related? Next, Jeff's parents got the news. First, his father and then his mother, Elaine. She remembers her husband calling her and telling her that Jeff had been shot and he was gone. She said it was tough for her to take. That's pretty understandable considering how close they were. They always talked and Elaine would frequently visit from Arizona. Now she'd be flying in for his funeral. Police had several motives to investigate. For the next few days, more and more of Jeff's close family and friends were notified and interviewed. Many described Jeff as a serial cheater, who was often a vulgar bully who got off on threatening and intimidating others, especially when he got angry. He was terrifying because of his size. Detectives were informed that Jeff was pro-Israel and had previously exchanged words with Palestine supporters. 
The detectives wondered if Jeff's political stance could have played a role in his shooting. They were also looking through Jeff's home and the computer he was using on the morning of his murder. Meanwhile, one day after his death, Jeff's autopsy was being conducted on June 17th, and detectives had attended to gather even more information about the circumstances surrounding his murder. As Jeff's clothing was being taken off and preserved as evidence, the pockets were turned inside out in case there was anything inside. And sure enough, in one of Jeff's pockets, there were rolling papers and a small amount of marijuana. And really, that's not too out of the ordinary or over the top, but they figured if he smoked marijuana, it was possible he had a dealer and maybe they needed to look into whether there had been any issues between Jeff and some nefarious characters that he may be associating with, considering they knew that he owed people money. The bullet that killed Jeff had entered through his cheek and exited underneath his right earlobe. The medical examiner confirmed that the bullet traveled through the roof of Jeff's mouth and the base of his tongue. This injury caused massive bleeding, which filled both of his lungs with blood. By all accounts, Jeff would have survived the gunshot wound if he hadn't drowned in his own blood. This was a horrible way to die. Wow. And that is just terrifying. And I was confused. Are they saying that he could have been saved if they were able to get him sooner. Because I'm thinking, okay, if he wasn't choking, but then I don't know. Because yeah. if it was massive, maybe there was no way. I'm just imagining him like swallowing his blood. Maybe because he was laying down while they were doing CPR. Anyway, that just sounds really terrifying. And I hadn't heard of that before. Investigators had a lot of suspects they had to systematically rule out. Bonnie's brother was also interviewed. He told investigators that Jeff was mad at the two football coaches and had been planning an elaborate revenge plot against them. But he didn't think either of them would be angry enough to murder Jeff, especially since it was Jeff who was out of the money, not them. Apparently, Jeff had already paid them quite a bit of cash, and they had stopped working and left the project unfinished, and that's what caused Jeff to blow up on them. Bonnie's brother also shared that Jeff was known to be mean, nasty, and prone to anger amongst family members. However, in the few months leading up to his murder, he had been acting extraordinarily regretful and apologetic, which was out of character for Jeff. He knew Jeff had been receiving death threats recently, and he thought that that might have something to do with the change in Jeff's demeanor. He said he'd never seen Jeff scared before, but he could tell Jeff was very bothered by the recent threats and maybe something else he wasn't telling anyone. Jeff refused to share anything with him when Bonnie's brother asked for the details about the threats. He also told investigators that he believed Jeff may have had a premonition about his death and begun making amends with everyone he had ever wronged, including his family. Apparently, he had taken the time to approach as many people close to him and express remorse for any turmoil he had caused them. You may be wondering what happened with some of Jeff's closest friends and business associates, the Georges. Well, while interviewing Brian and Bonnie, Brian went and got his electronic planner, which was a gift from his father, and gave investigators phone numbers for all the people close to Jeff, including the numbers and information for Cynthia and Ed George. So on June 18th, Sergeant Moriarty made his way to their sprawling estate to interview them, not just because they had been close with Bonnie and Jeff, but because a witness had come forward claiming that one of the women Jeff had cheated with was Cindy. And that is not really that hard to believe. But the surprising part was that this witness also claimed that this secret love affair had been going on for over a decade. That is a long time. And that Ed had possibly found out about it. And it was rumored that he had connections with organized crime. Detectives in the area were already familiar with the George family since they were so well known in their community. And Cindy wasn't just known for being Ed's wife. She was also well known for the numerous extramarital affairs. And it was possible that one of those men she had been with was their victim. When they showed up at the George's home, Cindy answered the door. She was the only one home at the time. Ed was still at work. And she seemed a little bit out of it, like she was medicated, like she was on something. Her eyes looked glazed over. Her speech was really slow. And when they asked her if she had learned of the news of Jeff Zach's death, she said yes. She knew. She learned of Jeff's murder the next day when Ed saw it in the Sunday morning paper. She explained that her husband had just simply handed her the newspaper article with Jeff's murder on it. When they asked Cindy questions, she would respond with, shouldn't we wait for Ed before I answer this question? And the investigators assured her that they would speak with Ed too. But for now, they only wanted her answers to their questions. When they asked Ed's whereabouts at the time of Jeff's murder, 
She told them he was at work with some of the Akron City health inspectors. When asked for her alibi, Cindy said she was home with all their children, getting them ready for a family wedding they attended later that Saturday afternoon. When investigators asked Cindy if she and Jeff were more than friends, she said no. She insisted that they were only close family friends and business acquaintances, nothing more. As the detectives tried to ask her more questions, she would not give them complete answers. She said she would have to wait for her husband to get back home. As Sergeant Morority scanned the interior of the home, it was in a bit of disarray. Boxes of Christmas decorations were stacked all over, even though it was in the middle of June. That seemed a little odd. Jeff's murder didn't seem to come as a surprise to Cindy. But as we know, she knew him very well. And perhaps with his demeanor, it was to be expected. Or maybe she knew more than what she was letting on. But before she went back inside, she told detectives that Jeff had harassed her in the past. But she didn't elaborate, and that's all she said. The next day, attorney Robert Meeker contacted investigators. He told them his clients, Cindy and Ed George, would no longer be available for interviews, and that any inquiries should go through his office. That wasn't unusual. The George family was very well known in the community, and they didn't want to be roped into a murder investigation. It wasn't a good look. Investigators had already confirmed both Ed and Cindy's alibi. The inspectors did confirm that Ed was at the restaurant from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. on June 16th. The household staff confirmed that the Georges, including their children, were all attending a family wedding that afternoon where hundreds of guests saw them. And this, too, was corroborated. Several times after this, Ed told investigators that he and Cindy would make themselves available for an interview. But each time they promised, they were a no-show. Having someone evade interrogation was a normal part in the investigation process, but investigators were not giving up. Eventually, they began trying to interview friends, relatives, and employees of the George family. Each time, they would agree to talk to them, but then right before their appointment, investigators would be informed that they were told by their attorney that it wasn't in their best interest to cooperate. And that attorney happened to also be the George's attorney. Since they couldn't get any more firsthand information about the alleged affair between Cindy and Jeff from the Georges, investigators decided to confront Bonnie with the news. To their surprise, Bonnie told them she already knew about it. Bonnie said while she was in the dark for years about the affair, Jeff confessed to their son, Brian, that he was in a relationship with Cindy when he was still really young. And I felt really bad about that. That's sad. That's a lot for a child to handle and to keep secret. Right. Brian was home that day and he joined the conversation telling the investigators that it was true. He knew that his dad and Cindy had a secret physical relationship. He explained that he remembered a time when his dad spent three days at Cindy's house and her husband, Ed, didn't know anything about it. Bonnie told the investigator she began suspecting that her husband and Cindy were having an affair back in 1998 when she accidentally overheard Jeff talking to Cindy on the phone. Jeff allegedly stated, quote, I can't get enough of being inside of you, end quote. When he hung up, Bonnie confronted him as she should have, and he said she was crazy. Like, yo, you're just hearing things. I didn't say that. And for a while, the gaslighting worked. And Bonnie started to doubt herself. Bonnie's doubts lingered, and she had to know for sure if the affair was real or if it was all in her head. So she decided the next time he left for an overnight business trip, she was going to follow him and find out for sure. Good. So when the time came, she followed him to the Sheridan Hotel in Cuyahoga Falls. She sat in the hotel lobby and finally saw her husband and the woman that she thought was a close friend of hers, Cindy George, enter together. They were kissing, and they were wrapped in each other's arms, and, and the, the story, story would end, end there for me. me. But <laughs> this <laughs> woman's a strong woman. But Bonnie kept her cool. She calmly walked up to them and stood there silently, waiting for them to acknowledge her and say something. But they did nothing. After their stunned silence, Bonnie walked out to the car, expecting Jeff to follow her and apologize. But that didn't happen. No. And he didn't come home that night either. Bonnie was home alone, replaying this awful night in her head. Instead, Jeff came home the following day, acting as if nothing happened. It wasn't until late 1999 that Jeff finally admitted to Bonnie that he had been in a relationship with Cindy for 10 years. So it was true. A decade. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but at that time, he told her the relationship was ending. But it actually began again. But this time, it was only platonic and business related. Sure it was. Armed with this new information, the detectives reached out to Jeff's mother, Elaine. 
They knew that they were very close and that Elaine had spent much time with Cindy over the years. They wondered if Jeff ever confided in his mother about the affair. Jeff's mom told investigators that she really liked Cindy. She stated, I like her a lot and said, quote, she was a fun, loving, beautiful girl, very charming. She seemed to be very sweet. And apparently her husband didn't pay much attention to her. As far as I knew, the relationship between Cindy and Jeffrey was intimate, but nothing was ever described to me. I just assumed because when he came out to visit me in Arizona, the phone rang all the time and it was always Cindy. They would talk for a few hours on his cell phone and she was always there when I came to visit Jeffrey in Ohio. I don't think she would have married him. She was living this life of wonderful wealth. She had this mansion and anything she wanted, end quote. Elaine said Jeff really loved and respected his wife, Bonnie, but he was unhappy with himself and that's what caused him to seek attention from other women. How can he, no, how is he respecting his wife? I can't help but feel like she's just trying to make lame excuses for her adult son, yeah. but I understand because she is his mother. I get it. Well, in the meantime, they were doing background checks on the George family and all of their employees. They had attempted to interview the staff members who worked at the Tangier as well as their nanny. Still, the Georges had a lot of pull in the community, and many people close to them remained tight-lipped. However, only some people kept quiet, and the detectives could find out some information from people who frequented the Tangier establishment and who knew of the George family. Apparently, when Jeff first introduced himself to Cindy at the bar that night back in 1991, he told her he was an Israeli doctor. And he couldn't practice in the United States, only back in Israel. For many months, Cindy believed Jeff. Eventually, she discovered that Jeff isn't a doctor. Instead, he is allegedly a former spy for the Mossad. She was very intrigued by this tall, seemingly mysterious man. Investigators found out that Cindy actually wrote the check for the 100 vending machines for Jeff's business, not Ed. Oh, wow. Jeff used this friendship and partnership with Cindy as an excuse to come over to her home when her husband, Ed, was at work. Wow. I mean, it's not that surprising. But in addition to their vending machine business, Cindy was also the one who hired Jeff to work around the house and the Tangier doing various construction jobs. Almost immediately after they met, Cindy became Jeff's primary income source. Jeff had even brought his mother Elaine to parties at the George's house when she visited from Arizona. All of the employees at the Tangier were still referring to Jeff as Dr. Zach. Even though they knew he was little more than Cindy's secret lover and Ed's handyman. The two would go off on long hikes or bike rides together almost every day. And this caused a lot of suspicion and speculation that their relationship had moved past being just professional. The only person who didn't seem suspicious of their relationship was Ed George. Some people thought Ed did know about the affairs, but that he willfully turned a blind eye, knowing that his strong Catholic faith would prevent him from divorcing Cindy. Other people thought that he didn't know and he never suspected it. And finally, after numerous attempts, the George's nanny, Marianne, agreed to speak with detectives and she spilled a lot of the George family secrets. She didn't appear to have much affection for Cindy and she described her as selfish and self-absorbed. She allegedly had very little time for her own children and spent the majority of her days shopping she was so obsessed with her appearance and would go shopping for a new outfit to wear when she would go shopping the next day. So she would basically be buying an outfit to go shopping in so that she could go shopping for another outfit to go shopping in. Does that make sense? Wow. Marianne said that Cindy George portrayed herself as the epitome of the perfect mother and wife, but she was really far from it. She revealed some unsettling truths about Cindy's behavior. She described her as manipulative with her phone always glued to her ear and engaging in a ton of affairs. And she said one of those men was most definitely Jeff Zack. She's seen it herself. She said when Ed wasn't home, Jeff would let himself into the George's house, greet the children, and then make his way into the George's marital bedroom with Cindy, where he and her would stay there for hours on end. One day, the children confided in the nanny that they had seen their mother and Jeff kissing. Marianne had also seen this for herself on several occasions, but what was even more concerning was Jeff's behavior towards Cindy. Over time, he became abusive and jealous. As a result, Jeff and Cindy's relationship became increasingly volatile. Marianne stated that Jeff would frequently scream and yell at Cindy, and there was even an incident in the past where he gave her a black eye. However, the most significant and compelling secret Marianne spilled was that sometimes one of the George's daughters 
would leave with Jeff and spend the night at the Zach household. What? That's weird. The nanny had a suspicion that this child, Cindy and Ed's youngest daughter, was actually Jeff Zach's biological child and not Ed's. Wow. Okay. Well, that's quite the bombshell. But the nanny said that even if Ed knew that the child wasn't his, he would not have treated her differently. Ed was overjoyed at the birth of their seventh child. He doted on her and would stay up nights with her when she was a newborn so that Cindy could get some sleep. However, it was true that this child, compared to the others, looked different. I mean, that alone doesn't mean that it isn't their child, but this was all very interesting. After this, the investigators arrived at Cindy's mother and sister's house. Helen Rohr, Cindy's mother, told investigators that she didn't really know Jeff Zack and couldn't tell them anything about him. So police decided to bluff. They asked Helen if she knew that Jeff had fathered one of Cindy's children. Helen said that the child looked like Cindy's paternal grandfather. The police asked how she knew which of the seven children he was asking about. And that's when she got angry and ended wow. the interview. She knew which one. That's pretty telling. Later, Ed and Cindy's attorney told investigators not to contact Cindy's family either. Well, remember when we told you that the investigators were going through the Zach home and found Jeff's computer? Well, when they did, they found family photos of Cindy and Ed with all their children. You know the holiday cards and pictures people send out during Christmas? Well, when they took a closer look at the Georgia's youngest daughter, she had a much lighter complexion and they thought she actually looked like Jeff Zach, more than she looked like any of her other siblings or Ed George. Plus, they found something else. Remember how Jeff had been on his computer the morning of his murder? Well, it turns out, unbeknownst to his family, Jeff was conducting a Google search for a woman. Can you guess which woman? Mm -mm. Cynthia George, the woman he secretly and then not so secretly was having an extramarital affair with all those years. Why was he Googling her? Yeah, that is curious. Why was he Googling her? Investigators decided they needed to shake up this united front between Cindy and Ed. So they made a shocking inquiry. They asked that the Georges produce their youngest child for a DNA test, the purpose of which was to determine if she was Jeff's biological child. Both Ed and Cindy were furious. Cindy was particularly outraged by the situation, but she did promise to comply several times but kept making excuses. Eventually, investigators were forced to get a warrant signed for a paternity test. On that day, Cindy and Ed showed up with their 8-year-old daughter. Cindy was enraged. The atmosphere at the hospital was tense, with this little girl feeling scared and overwhelmed. It was a straightforward procedure involving an oversized Q-tip inside the child's inner cheek, swabbing them just for a few seconds. Ed appeared relaxed and fatherly. He was a calming presence for his daughter. However, Cindy was anxious and angry and purposely upset her daughter. She told her she didn't have to cooperate and could keep her mouth shut. According to the book, If Looks Could Kill, Cindy failed to provide comfort and reassurance to her daughter, instead worsening her fears and telling her the police were going to hurt her. Eventually, Cindy was told to leave the room, and Ed sat his daughter on his lap and the entire procedure was over very quickly. As Ed exited the room, he said, quote, Honestly, I don't care what the tests show. You're my daughter and I love you, end quote. Aw, he really does seem to be a genuinely nice man. The results wouldn't be ready for at least three weeks, but once the lab report came back, it was settled. There was no question the test confirmed that Cindy and Ed's youngest child was fathered by Jeff Zack. Wow. What Cindy couldn't have known was how understanding her husband would react to the news. He told Cindy he loved her despite her moral failings, and he loved their children all of them, and he forgave her unconditionally. But it wasn't as easy for her older children to accept what she had done, but eventually they too forgave her. It was obvious that investigators were not going to break the bond between Cindy and Ed. So they tried a new investigative tactic. They checked to see if there had ever been any calls into the police from the George household, considering the nanny had said that Jeff had been physical towards Cindy in the past. But what they found wasn't from an incident in the past. It turned out that just a few weeks before the murder, Ed George called a friend of his at the police station and asked about what his options were for dealing with someone who had been threatening his wife. The officer recommended that he get a restraining order, but Ed didn't want to go public with the harassment, so he never followed up. Although he did confirm to this friend that the person harassing his wife was indeed Jeff Zack. But why would Jeff be harassing Cindy after all of these years? 
Investigators thought perhaps Jeff's son, Brian, may have a clue, since we know that Jeff confided in Brian about this affair with Cindy. And sure enough, when specifically asked about whether his dad had said anything odd about Cindy or Ed in the past few weeks, Brian admitted that recently, though he's not sure the exact time frame, he and his dad had been watching an episode of the show, 2020. And in an episode, the killer hires a hitman to kill his love rival. That's when Jeff made a spontaneous comment to his son. He told him if anything were to happen to him, it would probably be Ed George who did it. Jeff told his son that Ed had a lot of money to hire a hitman, and he had a lot of reasons to want him dead. Brian also told investigators that he heard his mother and father fighting over Cindy about six weeks earlier. He specifically heard his mother say that Cindy was not welcome in their home anymore and she would never be welcomed again, but he didn't know what the context was. So investigators went back to the witnesses who had given them inside information about the George family before. And one of those witnesses said that Cindy had recently broken off this entanglement that she had been in with Jeff and that he wasn't taking it well. This is why he kept calling her and she was forced to change her phone number more than once, which in turn caused her to finally confess to her husband that she had had an affair. Ed, who literally appeared to be the world's most understanding man, forgave Cindy, even blaming himself for being a workaholic and not being attentive enough to his wife's needs. But Cindy told Ed the bare minimum. She wasn't candid with him. She didn't tell him about any other affair she was having or the reason she stayed so long in this relationship with Jeff. This confession of hers was before Ed knew that Jeff was the father of their youngest daughter. According to an anonymous source, Jeff would often threaten Cindy the same way he threatened Bonnie by saying he was going to take his child from her. Allegedly, Jeff had told Cindy if she didn't continue their relationship, he would take the child they shared to Israel where he held dual citizenship and she would never see her child again. Recall that this was the same threat he regularly made to Bonnie concerning their son Brian. This anonymous source would have had no way of knowing what Jeff said to Bonnie. They were only familiar with the George family. With Jeff's alleged contacts and his ability to communicate in several languages, he told both mothers that they would never see their child again. This is how he kept Cindy locked into this relationship for years longer than she wanted to stay. And she had gotten to her breaking point after he became more volatile and physical with her. She tried to cut him loose, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. He wasn't that type to back down. Cindy stayed with Jeff for so many years because she said she was scared of him. Once she gave birth to his child, he allegedly told her, quote, your life is not your life anymore. Call the police. Call your mother. Who's going to believe you? Didn't you invite me over when your husband wasn't home? End quote. And despite these threats, Cindy continued the relationship for far past the birth of her and Jeff's child. The investigation was leaning towards Ed George as the primary suspect. There would be a motive to get Jeff to stop harassing his wife. Clearly, Ed forgave Cindy, even accepting the child as his own regardless of whether it was proven to be Jeff's. So it makes sense that if Jeff continued to be an issue for Cindy... Ed would try to make the problem disappear. Investigators tapped Jeff's mother's phone, and she agreed to call Cindy and talk to her about Jeff to see if she would crack. When Elaine asked her how Ed handled the fact that she had been involved with Jeff all those years, Cindy got nervous and defensive, and she blatantly said, quote, If you think my husband had anything to do with this, you are mistaken, end quote. Still, the investigators were confident that either Ed alone or Ed and Cindy together were responsible for Jeff's murder, but they faced a significant challenge in identifying the gunman. Clearly, neither Ed nor Cindy had carried this out themselves. This issue posed a significant roadblock in the investigation, leaving the police with no clear leads or suspects. As time passed, frustration grew among the police force. Despite their efforts and countless hours dedicated to the case, nearly a year had gone by and they were still no closer to solving Jeff's murder. The lack of progress was disheartening, not only for the police, but also for Jeff's family and friends. They wanted justice to be served. So it was going on almost a year at this point, and they weren't any closer to knowing who killed Jeff. So again, they tried a new investigative tactic. They began asking informants if they knew anything about the ninja-styled motorcycle with the green trim. Investigators had been looking for it, and eventually, they found one that had been put up for sale located on a lot out of state. When investigators called about this motorcycle, the dealer told them that he came into possession of this bike from his wife, but 
it wasn't her bike. Apparently, her ex-husband had given it to her for free in exchange for a $5,000 credit for outstanding child support. His wife's ex-husband was a man by the name of John Savino. He told his ex-wife to go ahead and sell the bike quickly, and guess when this was? Right after the murder. As a matter of fact, it was just a couple days after the murder. John had driven this bike from Ohio to Pennsylvania in the middle of the night on June 18th. He explained to his ex-wife that he had just been caught speeding on the bike, and the police saw him, so now he had to sell it. And get this, when he brought the bike across state lines, he covered up the lime green accents with black duct tape. That's kind of, that's all very sketchy, but he owed her money. So his ex-wife agreed to take the bike and sell it in exchange for taking the $5,000 off of his debt that he owed with the district attorney's office. And sure, it could be a coincidence, but in law enforcement, they lean more toward it being a lead, but they knew nothing about this John Safino guy. Who was he? And if he was the killer, what was his connection to Jeff? They ran a background check on him and found information on another potential contact who could have information about John, another one of his ex-wives named Christine Tadero. She lived in Ohio, Akron to be exact. When investigators showed up at Christine's door, she was reluctant to cooperate. She told them she was scared of John. Her words were that he was a maniac. He would go from zero to Mach 10 in three seconds. Anything could set him off. Just off the scale is best to describe him. The investigators assured her that her family would be safe. She agreed to speak to them. And according to John's ex-wife, Christine, he was a 35-year-old truck driver and a violent man. She told them she left John after he punched her son in the face. When she returned to her home to collect some of her things, she made the mistake of going alone. Once there, John was angry and wanted Christine to change her mind and take him back. She refused, and things escalated quickly. He held her hostage for several hours. When she ran through the door, he caught up to her and pushed her against it. He was holding the door shut with Christine's body. He then grabbed her arm and pulled it behind her back until it broke in two places. Oh my gosh. Christine was in excruciating pain, and she begged for him to let her go and seek medical attention. Eventually, he allowed her to leave if she promised to say she broke it by slipping on ice. He told her he would kill her if she went to the police. She believed him. She knew how crazy he was. And she also knew he killed Jeff Zack, or at least this is what she told investigators. This was a huge accusation, but Christine said she was positive John was responsible. Of course, they wanted to know why she believed this. She said that one month before Jeff Sack was shot at the gas station, John told her he had an issue with a tall, white-haired Israeli man that he had gotten to a fight with, and if he saw him again, he was going to kill him. Well, later, when Christine saw Jeff's photo in the newspaper after he was killed, she knew it was too coincidental, and she called her ex. When Christine got John on the phone, she asked him if he was responsible for shooting and killing Jeff Zack. John Zafino replied by giggling and saying, quote, well, let's just say the guy's not going to have to part his hair anymore, end quote. It wasn't a confession, but the way he acted after telling her this made her believe it was true. And then he threatened to kill her, her son, and her father if she went to the police. This was a pretty big break in the case for investigators, the first one that they had really gotten in Jeff's case. Next, Christine agreed to wear a wire and try to get John to talk about Jeff's murder. But Christine needed a reason to contact John, so the detectives planted a murder story in the local newspaper. This carefully crafted narrative would be the perfect excuse for Christine to contact her ex-husband. But when she did, he was paranoid about being recorded, and he talked in code. Once, he even told her that he brought something with him that could scan her and make sure she wasn't wired. And Christine played it off really well. She sounded outraged and told him if he didn't trust her, then they shouldn't be talking. This set John at ease, but he still never blatantly confessed to killing Jeff. Although, when Christine said incriminating things, he wouldn't deny them. He would just tell her not to repeat anything to anyone, or he would kill her too. On one recording, which we will play for you, John said, If they pin this on him, he's gone for life and maybe the electric chair. But the only thing between him and them is Christine. Well, Christine was like, no, not me, her. But John was like, no, you. And Christine said, Cindy fucking George. 
But John just repeated that the only thing that would ever put him in prison and to death was her, meaning Christine. So let's listen. If they pin this on me, I'm going to select. And maybe the left is here. So the only thing between me and there is you. you no, know, uh, no, you uh, don't. You're the only thing that would ever put me <laughs> in prison and to death is you. But you. Well, So he didn't confess, but he felt like he was being targeted for sure. Investigators began locating people who knew John and interviewing them. John was described by all the people who knew him as a brute and a bully. He was hot-tempered and the point of being dangerous. Christine told investigators that despite his high IQ, he was sick and sadistic. Investigators thought he would be a perfect type of person to carry out a hit. When they interviewed one of his coworkers, they got their next lead. This coworker said he sold John two guns and one of the guns just days before the murder. And when the coworker provided the make and model of the guns, one of them matched the type of gun used to shoot Jeff. Next, the investigators looked at the DMV records and made another significant discovery. John registered a motorcycle that matched the description that one of the witnesses saw at the scene. The VIN matched the one his ex-wife had up for sale. Now they had a gun and a motorcycle that belonged to a violent man who lived in Ohio who had also told his ex-wife he was going to kill an Israeli man with white hair. Not only that, but to go one step further, the apartment that John was living in was leased by someone else, presumably Cindy George, because when investigators went out there to interview neighbors, they showed them a picture of Cindy and the neighbors said that they saw her there all the time with John. The two of them would walk around the neighborhood and she would be inside his apartment for hours. Wow. It wasn't long before they found John's friends who confirmed that he had told them Cindy was his girlfriend. Interesting. And it turned out the two of them met a year earlier in the summer of 2000. Cindy was waiting for Ed at a jazz bar called the Groove Shack. When Ed didn't show up, she started to leave. And that is when John stopped her and introduced himself. He told her he couldn't let her walk out there alone because there were dangerous people everywhere. While Cindy tried to reject his advances, she told him she was married and that she had seven children. He asked her, are you Catholic or Amish? And this made her laugh. And eventually they got to talking and they exchanged phone numbers. Looking at the timeline, it was around the same time she started hanging out with John that she broke things off with Jeff. And it was clear that Cindy and John were more than friends. Cindy had actually purchased John a cell phone so they could communicate. And investigators also established It was her that rented him his apartment. He went from struggling to pay his rent every month to having it paid for him. That's when investigators pulled Cindy's bank records and get this, not only was she paying his rent, but bank records showed that Cindy withdrew $5,300 on May 24th, 2001. And guess what John did that same day, a couple hours later, he walked into a motorcycle shop and purchased a ninja style bike with lime green accents. They tracked down the dealer, John paid in cash, and told the dealer that he didn't intend on keeping the spike for long. Why would you even say that? So incriminating. When the dealer was shown a lineup of suspects, he picked out John Safino as the man who purchased the bike. Here's the receipt. We have it on the screen. And there's John's name and his address connecting him to the sale. This is when John indeed became the prime suspect in Jeff's shooting. Investigators believed he was either hired by Cindy outright to kill Jeff or convinced to kill him on her behalf out of manipulation. At this point, John's ex-wife, Christine Tadero, had secretly recorded phone calls for three months but could not get him to admit anything directly. But she did know that John allegedly had an alibi for that day that Jeff was murdered. He was at a car show with one of his friends. We're going to call that friend Mike. He was with John on June 16th, but he also told investigators that he knew John had a girlfriend named Cindy and that she was highly possessive. Once, Mike gave John a ride somewhere and Cindy called him incessantly. She also made him quit his job so he would spend more time with her. After Mike gave investigators John's alibi, he told John that they had come to speak with him. And at this point, John got really angry and he told him to keep his mouth shut because he was being set up. And then the next day, John shows up back at Mike's house and he's not home. So he gets really angry and he scared his wife so badly that when he left, she grabbed the kids and met her husband at the police station. They were afraid of John and now they wanted some type of protection. They believed he was dangerous. That's when Mike admitted to investigators 
that John had actually shown up at his door four hours after Jeff had been murdered. So this shattered John's alibi, but they still wanted to pull up his phone records. And when they did, they matched his number to one that was in Cindy's records. They started talking months before Jeff's murder and his GPS did not place him at the car show. Now investigators not only knew that Mike had been intimidated into giving a false statement on John's behalf about his alibi, but phone records connected Cindy and John. They talked several times on June 16th, one call coming in just an hour before Jeff was murdered, and then another about an hour afterward. Even though all of this evidence against John was circumstantial, it was enough to make an arrest. And on September 25th, 2002, John was arrested for Jeff Zach's murder. John insisted he had nothing to do with it, and he was only a casual acquaintance of Cindy's, nothing more. But investigators were not buying it. There was evidence that they believe pointed to a failed attempt to kill Jeff in early May. At that time, Cindy was on two phones at the same time. On one phone, she was talking to John, who was probably listening intently because on the other phone, Cindy was talking to Jeff Zach at the same time. And when this was going on, John was at Cuyahoga Valley National Park and a police officer came across him. When they looked in his car, they saw an empty gun holster in his front seat. And when they asked where the gun was, he said, oh, I just left it at home. Then they asked him why he was out in the woods. And John told him he was meeting his married lover for some private time. A few days later, someone that was hunting for mushrooms in the same area came across a 32 caliber handgun. John had a receipt for that gun. He had bought it from that friend of his, the coworker, and that gun had gone missing. It's likely that when he went back looking for it, it had already been found or he couldn't exactly remember where he had hidden it in the dark. So investigators believe that Cindy was trying to lure Jeff out into the woods that night so that her new lover, John, could kill him. Because remember, the Cuyahoga Falls was where the hotel was that Bonnie had caught Cindy and Jeff that night when they just disregarded her presence. This was an area where Jeff and Cindy would meet. Once the police showed up and confronted John, the plan had to be abandoned. The phone records from that night told a powerful story. While John was waiting in the woods with a gun, he was on the phone with Cindy for three hours. Jeff was also on the other phone with Cindy. His phone calls were shorter, while John's calls were continuous. One call was seven minutes and the other was five. More calls were 20 minutes in length. So it appeared that Cindy kept calling Jeff back trying to get him to meet her in the woods. Wow. So it's, to me, it's so obvious when I see things like this, but it's circumstantial. But the prosecution felt like they had enough evidence to convict John Zafino of aggravated murder and the conspiracy to commit murder. They also had an FBI voice analysis done, and John's voice was matched with the person who had left the threatening messages on Jeff's phone the days leading up to his murder. Once John was arrested, investigators were hoping he would plead guilty to a lesser charge and testify against Cindy as the mastermind of Jeff's murder. But that didn't happen. He denied everything. Here's him being interviewed and saying that some random guy got killed. Some guy, I don't even know, got killed. There's a lot of murders going on. I don't care. I deal with what's in my world, you know. Buzz off is my attitude when it comes to the cops trying to say all this and there's no evidence. None. He minds his own business, implying he knows nothing about it. He said the cops had no proof, and his response to them going after him was literally buzz off. There was no evidence. None. John's trial began on February 26, 2003. His sister Judy couldn't imagine that her brother could be involved in such a horrendous crime. She was beside herself and convinced her brother was innocent, and she was devastated by the charges against him. Here's Judy explaining that now. It's just not possible that John could be guilty of such a horrendous crime. Cindy must have some way to prove my brother's innocence. She knows that she didn't have John do this. John's sister was in the courtroom for his entire trial. So was Jeff's mother and family. But guess who wasn't there? At least not by their own will. Ed and Cindy George. They refused to show up. So much for being great friends with Jeff. But by March 7th, Cindy and Ed were subpoenaed by the prosecution to testify against John. Now they had to come. Cindy appeared first alongside her attorney, Mike Bowler, who told the court that she planned to assert her Fifth Amendment right 
not to incriminate herself. So she just left the witness stand. And then her long-suffering husband, Ed George, was next. He invoked marital privilege and was able to avoid most of the questioning. But he did tell the jury that he and Jeff Zack had a customer relationship that turned into a casual friendship and eventually a business relationship. He said that Jeff was at his home for all the important events in his children's lives, from recitals to first communions. So how is that casual? I don't know. But he told the jury how Jeff would call their home repeatedly and then hang up. This is what prompted him to reach out to that friend at the police department and ask what he could do to stop this harassment. But Ed said he was looking for a legal solution to his problem. And that was all Ed would say. The jury later said they were disappointed because they really wanted to hear from Cindy herself. The prosecution inferred that it was Cindy with her relationship with John who had found a more permanent solution to her Jeff Zach problem. When John was asked if he knew or had met Jeff, he testified he hadn't. He'd only heard of Jeff after he was arrested. But the best witness against John was his ex-wife, who testified over the three months of phone call recordings with John. They were played for the jury, and between his threats and his non-denials, the evidence was damning. Bonnie testified about her husband's 10-year affair with Cindy George. She also told the jury about the June 13th threatening phone messages from John that had caused Jeff to become frantic, upset, and caused him to pace around the kitchen. Jeff was afraid of Cindy's new lover. It was the George family's nanny, Mary Ann Brewer, who painted a picture of how Jeff went from a welcomed guest to a menacing and harassing presence in Cindy's life. Her testimony laid the foundation for the motive for Cindy to want Jeff dead, or at the very least, for someone who loves Cindy to be willing to kill Jeff as a protective act. John's defense attorney, Larry Whitney, focused on the lack of witnesses and that there was no physical evidence. No one saw John and there was no DNA. There was no trace evidence left behind linking his client to the murder. But if we have learned anything from the Dan Markell case, you don't have to be placed at the scene of the crime to be connected with it or guilty of it, especially in a conspiracy. So on March 10th, 2003, after four hours of deliberation, John Safino was convicted of first-degree aggravated murder. The jury thought the prosecution delivered a better case than the defense and that the defense didn't have any way to rebut the evidence. They couldn't make it make sense. Jeff's mother, Elaine, was exhilarated. She said, that animal shot her son. And for what? But John's family was devastated. Judy was sitting right near Jeff's family, but she couldn't say anything to them because she was so distraught. The sentencing was one week later. Bonnie's impact statement was about how hard it was to tell their son his father was dead. John was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 2026. In prison, he called his sister Judy talking about his appeal. And he said the George's name and told his sister to tell the George's to write the check to get him out of there. And if they didn't, there would be consequences. And you may be wondering why Cindy hadn't been charged. Well, you just wait. Apparently at this point, there was no direct evidence to charge her, but there were all these jail phone calls and John had been mentioning her and how she held the key to this case. He appealed his conviction. It was upheld by the District Court of Appeals in December of 2003, but on January 10th, 2005, while Cindy is out shopping at the mall, she was finally arrested for conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. She was taken to Summit County Jail and placed on a $10 million bond. But eventually, it was reduced to $2 million and her loving and devoted husband posted her bail. Cindy's trial began in November of 2005. She didn't believe that she was going to get a fair trial because they weren't going to be nice to a rich white lady who had everything. So she opted for what they call a bench trial. That meant it would be a judge who would be deciding her guilt. The evidence against her was mostly the same as the evidence against John, except for several letters that she had written while she was in custody. Oh my gosh. It appeared that Cindy had used her attorney to send letters to John's sister, Judy who shared the contents of these letters with her brother. In one of the letters, they arranged to pay $15,000 of John's defense costs. And the reason why is because she said in the letter that their cases were aligned. That's so incriminating. But just wait, because this is kind of a crazy, crazy ending. In one of the letters, 
John instructed his sister to send an email to the George's attorney. I hate reading these things verbatim because I feel like it's boring, but we really need to tell you what is said in these letters. So I think I want to tweak the audio to make it sound like one of those flashbacks when someone's like opening the letter. So we're going to do that, right? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. My friend and I had an agreement that if anything happened to me, they would do whatever it takes to set me free. Now I did exactly what I said I would do. And now I need my friend to do the same. It's like now I'm in prison and no one has time for me anymore. My life isn't over yet. I still have a chance of coming home. Prosecution felt that this was a smoking gun and that it showed Cindy had hired John to kill Jeff Zack. And now he was asking for her help. John also told his sister, I need you to take control of everything. The longer we wait, the less the media will want the story. And I think we may be able to use them to help me. If Larry Whitney won't act quickly, then you can call you know who and explain what we need to do. And they need to know the longer I sit in here with nothing being done, the matter I get. And before long, the shit is going to hit the fan. I can still make a call and get a deal. It may be for 15 or 18 years, but it's better than 23 to life. I have refrained from writing to you, hoping things would turn out differently for my brother. However, since John is still not home, I find that I need help. It took a couple of days after the guilty verdict for my brother to realize that he was indeed stranded. It is amazing the things that I have learned about the twisted relationship between the two of you. You had him so convinced that you were a Christian and a good, kind, loving person. He was so infatuated with you that I didn't have the heart to tell him that true Christians don't cheat on their husbands and families and live lives based on lies. I find it hard to believe that you would let this happen to John when you have the power and the financial means to help him. I don't care what you have to do, but you must get additional lawyers. You and your family have the means to take care of this. I, on the other hand, have the media asking for interviews and stories. The more John talks to me, the more I have to tell. I will do what I need to do at this point. That's quite the veiled threat to the George family. That letter from John Safino's sister came with an accompanying letter from John himself. That letter was the most incriminating of all, and it read, quote, What are you going to do now? You said that you would not leave me here. I could have knocked 20 years off my sentence if I would implicate you. I stuck by you. Now I've lost my life. I will be 60 years old when I'm up for parole, and I may not get out then. Your lawyers did not help me. Now I need some new lawyers to fight for my life. If you are worried about your business, sell it, and your house too. If that's what it takes to get me out, at any cost, you need to help me now. Show me I have not gone through this hell in vain. I would rather be dead than to live like this. You need to tell your husband what I need, and that he needs to help me now. You need to help me. I need some big lawyers, and it will cost a lot of money. Please do whatever it takes to free me. Send all your future letters to my sister, Judy. May the Lord be with you and guide you. End quote. Cindy actually responded to this letter with some Bible verses and a whole lot of flattery. And it must have worked too, because John never testified against Cindy. Her letter to John read in part, quote, There will come a day that I shall perceive you as anything other than you are. That is the strongest man I've ever known. No instance or person will ever change that image. You have to understand that if you really dig deep, Jesus will take your hand. I know how sorrowful you are, and my heart aches every day. My day starts by going to church every morning, and a mass is offered for you, your strength and safety. Yes, the storm is quite great and devastating, but plant your feet and dig. The Spirit of God is within you and always with me. His power is great. We will walk into the storm with one who is more powerful than all. We must, though, listen to counsel. God is also working through them, too. Pray for their wisdom. We cannot make one mistake. Johnny, 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 I'm so worried about you. We all love you and need you to come home safely. I will leave you in God's hands, trusting in him always. Lastly, I feel so badly that I cannot comfort Judy. She's in my prayers daily. I look forward to the day I can meet her. End quote. 
And after reading or listening to that, you can see how easily Cindy is able to manipulate John into doing her dirty work and staying quiet about it. After that exchange of letters, one of Cindy's attorneys managed his appeal for him. Wow. Yes, yes and all of those letters were introduced at Cindy George's bench trial, as well as the taped phone conversation we played for you from John to his sister asking for her to demand money from the George family and pay for a top-rated attorney like Johnny Cochran. And some of you true crime listeners out there, you might recognize that name. Johnny Cochran was one of O.J. Simpson's attorneys, the one that coined the phrase, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. If you know, you know, and most of you know. At the end of Cindy's seven-day trial, the judge found her guilty of complicity in the aggravated murder of Jeff Sack. She received the same sentence as John Safino, but don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. She got 23 years to life. Cindy, of course, denied her guilt right before she was taken into the Reformatory for Women in Marysville. But her stay there was short-lived, and I was shocked. Ed George hired new attorneys for his wife, who filed an appeal claiming that Judge Crossgrove should not have allowed Michael Bowler and Robert Meeker to represent Cindy because they had been involved in the suspicious payment of $15,000 to John and his attorney. Due to conflict of interest, her new attorney argued she was denied competent counsel. On March 22, 2007, the Ninth Ohio District Court of Appeals voted to reverse Cindy's conviction because there was insufficient evidence to prove her guilt. And they ordered her to be immediately released. Of course, the prosecution appealed this decision to the Ohio Supreme Court, but lost on August 30th, 2007. So not only did the appellate court reverse her conviction, meaning she was out of jail, but they did so with prejudice, which means that Cindy could never be prosecuted again for Jeff Zach's murder. And honestly, could not believe this. Of course, the Zach family believed that this was a great injustice. In their opinion, if it wasn't for Cindy George, Jeff Zach would still be alive. After her conviction was overturned, Cindy had quite the homecoming. There was a picture of her among all of her children just smiling and hugging them. Cindy was also interviewed by a local reporter to set the record straight. She explained that she was terrified of Jeff Zach. She was forced to remain in a relationship with him. She told reporter Chris Evans that Jeff told her if she tried to leave him, he would skin her alive and hang her body on the flagpole outside of her mansion for her husband and children to find. Jeff also allegedly gave her a two-page handwritten letter with a list of rules, one of which was that she needed to call him or page him every four hours and only leave her home in the company of her husband or children. She couldn't go anywhere alone because he was scared she was cheating on him when she's cheating on her husband with him. So she was too terrified to disobey him. So from that day forward, she felt like Jeff's prisoner. She would wake up in the middle of the night with night terrors that Jeff was standing over her and threatening to send mail bombs to her children. According to Cindy, Jeff had also threatened to pour acid down her throat and set her on fire. He would constantly call her and verbally berate her. Now this part was confirmed by Bonnie, who once heard Jeff on the phone screaming at Cindy. And she remembered thinking, He's just as abusive to Cindy as he was to her. That's sad. Cindy also alleged that a few weeks before John's murder, she came to his home to tell him it was over. This was when he allegedly punched her in the stomach, stuffed her into a garbage can, and shoved an AK-47 into her mouth. He then began to threaten her to kill her if she ever left him. Jeff would also harass the nanny, calling and demanding to speak to Cindy. When the nanny said she wasn't available, he would accuse her of lying. One night, he set his computer to auto-dial Cindy's home every 10 minutes. Her children couldn't sleep, and Ed had it with the harassment. It's possible that John felt the same way watching someone he loved be harassed and took matters into his own hands. Cynthia and Ed George are still together living a quiet life. Ed chose to forgive his wife and even took the blame for neglecting her for his work. Ed George sold the iconic Tangier Entertainment Complex to the LeBron James Foundation in 2020. It's been remodeled and renamed the House 330. The LeBron James Foundation plans to use this place for its I Promise school program for students and their families and special public events. John Safino remains incarcerated and will be eligible for parole in September of 2025. That's not too far from now. No, it's not. 
and Jeff's son, Brian Zach, sued Ed and Cynthia George for wrongful death. The two sides settled on a $650,000 settlement, with the Georges refusing to admit any wrongdoing. Brian received $428,000 of that settlement, and the rest went to attorney's fees and costs. Well, this has been a very interesting story. Yes. It's not all the time we talk about a victim who had different sides of them that were not always good. But in the end, it's not justified to kill someone. I'm sure there were a lot of other things she could have done to stop him from harassing her. Oh, absolutely. Murder is definitely not the answer. I found it interesting that Ed George blames himself for staying busy at work while his wife is out there cheating. I mean, maybe that's the case. Maybe that's how she felt. But I don't know. I really think that communication is probably the strongest thing in most of these cases. Yeah, because we've never heard anything negative about him from people that he was like angry or mad or mean. seems like he was very forgiving. That might be because of his faith. But we thank you so very much for sticking with us with this video and learning everything that we have today. Give us your thoughts in the comments. We always like to hear what you think and have to say about the situation. And thank you so much for staying with us. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on what's next. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye.